On this episode of Resi Week, Shell acquires Sonin, Sonance and Sonos co-develop speakers, and the Nest Secure has a microphone and no one knew. All this and more on this episode of Resi Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is Resi Week, episode 160, The Privacy Jugular. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Atlona, the go to provider for AV signal distribution and control in corporate, higher education, and residential spaces. Welcome to Resi Week. This is your weekly wrap up of all the latest news and stories for the residential AV industry. I'm your host, Matt D. Scott for AVNation.tv. And today I'm pleased to be joined by Jason Knott. He is the senior editor of CE Pro. How are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me today. Thank you so much for joining us. Then we have a, a, a newbie today, Ian Bryant. He is the senior director of technology applications and innovation at Cedia. How are you, my friend? Do it just fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And last but not least, we have Joe Whitaker. He is the president and owner of The Thoughtful Home. How are you doing, Joe? Doing well, doing well. Glad to be back on the show. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, we're going to start this off with a story that comes to us from CE Pro. This came out last week, and it just uh, was a, a touch too late to get on our show for last week. So we're going to talk about it this week. Shell acquires Sonin, the home energy storage system. Uh, this is incredibly big news, A for Sonin, uh, who is very uh, strong in our uh, you know, AV industry channel, uh, but also big for Shell, uh, just big for the smart energy storage you know, industry in general. And luckily for us, we have Michelle Mapple. She is the director of sales and marketing for Sonin here to talk about this with us uh, this week. So thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on the purchase. I, thank wanted, you. To, I wanted to jump into a, just a couple of quick questions. Um, and again, thanks for, for making the time. Sonin has been uh, a fairly strong company coming out of Germany. They're doing a lot of very new and, and, and really innovative things. Shell, on the other hand, hey, they're they're investing heavily in you know renewable energy and and a, a lot of you know new energy initiatives. What brought Shell and Sonin together? Sure, it's a great question. And first of all, thanks for taking the time to bring us on the show. We're really excited to talk about this. Um, we have had Shell as an investor in Sonin, the global organization of Sonin, since last year. And so they've been playing a role in looking at what Sonin is bringing to the table. As you mentioned, we are very much innovators in the energy management space. And you know, starting back in 2008, we really developed our first energy storage technology and since then have gotten better, faster, stronger, smarter. Uh, you know, the Shell New Energies group is the one who saw Sonin as a real opportunity. And so for us, it's partnering with them to figure out we now not only have intelligent energy management, but we've got intelligent energy automation, which we'll talk a little bit about and how that affects the home automation world. And we've also got virtual power plants. So we have these Sonin communities where we are looking at not only how does an individual home control its energy, modify its energy, utilize energy, make sure it's got its own energy, including clean energy, but then how do we take that into a greater community and create these virtual power plants that can provide larger scale services and really helps modernize our existing grid infrastructure. So, so Sonin really has been on the forefront of this. We are a leader in innovation. We're a leader in energy management and we're really just getting started. So we see the partnership with Shell New Energies as an opportunity to take what we've already done and really scale it up globally. I mean, this is a, an investment in the entire global organization. They are going to be owning Sonin. Uh, Sonin will still remain Sonin, so we will be independent. We will still have our chief uh, executive officer globally, as well as we've got our management teams in various countries. But this is really an investment in growing us globally. And we're excited about it because it, it will take us to a whole scaling level that will change the way that Sonin is really integrating throughout the world. As, as Sonin is currently, you know, set up in, in its relationship to our, our channel and our mm -hmm. industry, are there 
going to be, and, and again, you may not be able to answer this, but are there going to be any perceivable you know, changes or impacts on the way Sonin is relating to, you know, myself as an integrator going forward? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, that, again, the whole point here is that Shell New Energies is investing in us because they see us as this company that has the ability to scale up. So they want us to become, you know, stay our own entity and work directly with integrators. So for our, for, for Sonin U.S., it will not change. We will continue to work directly with integrators. We will continue to work through the business channels that we have. Again, it just gives us greater opportunity to, you know, increase our R&D pipeline to go out and really increase the amount of energy management systems that are out there to look at new projects and new possibilities and scale up at a great level where we can really just take everything we've done and exponentially increase it. So, so we'll continue to work very closely with the integrators and home automation channel. And you guys are really on the forefront of you've been in homes, you've been helping customers figure out how to manage energy. We're coming in with a cool, innovative way of taking that to a whole new level or a different level as well. So let me ask you this. When we start looking at, you know, Sonin, and obviously this has been a huge investment for, for Shell, what is it so important about this shift to, you know, residential energy storage and how it impacts, you know, really our, our channel from the, the integration standpoint of being able to control and manage that beyond something as, you know, as rudimentary as just flipping on a generator. Sure. Uh, a couple things, you know, you look at the landscape and utilities as well as states and governments are figuring out how we integrate more clean energy and renewables into everything that we're doing. You have all of these renewable portfolio standards, as you guys have heard, California has got a goal to be 100% renewable energy. Hawaii has a goal. New York has a goal. So there are all of these policies out there that are being put into place. In addition to that, you've got the utilities that are looking into, okay, how do we incorporate renewables into our existing grid infrastructure? Because it was never built to do that. So, so what we do is we take the systems where you on the integrator side are saying, how do I take a homeowner and help them better manage their energy? What the Sonin system will allow them to do is work directly with all the systems that you're already using with the homeowner, and it'll help them manage that to use it the right way at certain times of day to use more solar to power those devices and those those intelligent home management systems to also then be able to again aggregate into larger communities so multiple houses can offset each other and so again it, it, it all leads back up into individual control at the homeowner where you still get comfort you don't sacrifice quality of energy and they still are able to manage their home devices and the energy levels there but then there's an added benefit for the greater utility, the greater communities, because now all of a sudden we're utilizing the energy resources we have better, whether it's solar resources or even just baseload resources that are generated at two in the morning that nobody necessarily needs at 2 a.m. Well, now we have a, an energy storage battery system that you can take that 2 a.m. energy, put it in a bunch of batteries, and then people can use that to power their homes in the morning. So it, it's again, just more effectively using resources that we have across the entire channel. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for taking a few moments to stay with us. Of course. Um, if you have a second to, to hang out while we, we go around the panel, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, but if you do have to go, just give everyone a, a quick um, snippet on where they can get more information on Sonin, uh, et cetera. Of course. Absolutely. Uh, you can visit us at soninusa.com. So it's S-O-N-N-E-N-U-S-A.com. And, or you can email us at sales at soninusa.com. We are more than happy to talk about what we're doing, especially in the energy automation space. It's a real revolution. Uh, we are also doing an energy automation pioneer tour, which I know Jason has written about on CE Pro. There's also a calendar of dates on CE Pro that show where these energy automation shows are coming to a town near you. So check that out and see. Uh, they are absolutely informational. So come learn about energy automation, learn about storage, learn about Sonin, how we work with you and solar in installers and how we really are trying to bring this whole new revolution to the table. So those are a couple ways you can find out more about Sonin. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, again, if you have a moment to, to of course. hang out, that'd be great. Jason, I, I wanted to come to you first with this, uh, specifically because you wrote the, the wonderful article that we're using here. Um, you know, I, I personally have been a big fan of Sonin for, for quite a while. 
Uh, full disclosure, I am a Sonin dealer as well. But what I wanted to ask you was, we look at this within the industry. We look at this as a, a, a huge deal, not so much just because it's Sonin, but because it's Shell jumping into somebody who is so strong in the smart home automation side. Is it as big of a deal as we think it is? Or is it just a big deal because we're in this channel and we look at this as a big deal? No, I think it's a very big deal. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things that are going on in this energy automation space or niche right now, just so you could make the same argument with the wellness space and some of these other categories. But seven or eight years ago, so were shades and some of these other categories that integrators are so heavily engaged with now. And I think Michelle maybe even understates it a little bit in my conversations with her and with uh, Blake there they were saying how it's amazing that a lot of the utilities didn't even know that the Cedia channel exists. It's true. They don't even know about integrators. They don't know that there, there's this whole group of community out there that can take what they're doing on the utility side and, and integrate it at the smart home level. And the integrators, I don't think, re recognize the key position that they are in right now to take advantage of this space. Um, uh, whether that's combining, you know, electric cars. We don't think there's going to be more electric cars, you know, 10 years from now or 20 years from now. Think about that element of it, but then talk about what we're doing with climate control, shade control, lighting control. The fixture category is so hot right now for integrators. Um, I, you know, based upon this, and based upon my conversation, I kind of threw out there that integrators really should seriously be looking at obtaining a uh, line voltage electrical license for the company either uh, under their you know purview or hiring somebody who works with them closely because they really are the key intersection point that's taking place here so again the caveat being that i recognize that it's a niche market right now but i do think it's going to be a very big deal and shell being part of it makes it even much more prevalent and, and prominent than it is right now very good. Absolutely. Well, and just to echo on what Jason's saying, uh, you know, we see, we hear the value from utilities. We sit at the table with utilities and we talk about what is this energy automation delivered that all the way down to the device level in the home, all the way up to controlling the entire home and, and really just helping utilize and mitigate energy usage during certain times of day. I mean, our communities are exactly designed for that. Certain times of day, the homes can basically be off grid more or less or go invisible to the grid. And that's a really big value stream for the utilities. And they're, they're becoming more aware of there are a lot of opportunities to get into that homeowner level. So, it's, so you're right, the integrator channel, you guys have a lot of opportunity and power here. Very good. Ian, along that same line, how do we as, a, as an industry, how do we go after this kind of market, which to a degree, it's within our purview. It's stuff that we know. We know how to automate. We know how to deal with that. But it's line voltage. It's it's power. It is a completely, like it's the same vertical, but it's a completely different vertical. How does the industry really know how to go after that? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it is going to be uh, partnering up with local trade, other local trades um, or um, what we were talking about a minute ago, which is uh, trying to get your your line voltage uh, certification, get someone on staff that is uh, electrical tradesman. Um, we're already, like you were saying, we're already in the space. Um, we're already doing lighting control. Um, we're already doing um, energy management, but this is just taking it to another level. And what I wanted to really point out was um, the, if you see in the news recently, we have the the Green New Deal that we're trying to, was trying to get put together it, it, the, the quote unquote green new deal that's being proposed right now may not happen but it gives you an idea of where we're going uh with with energy management and conservation and this is flows i was really excited actually when i when i um heard about this acquisition and taking sona to a whole nother level um it's going to allow our integrators to get in but we have to take the initiative to get into that space as as quickly as possible um, otherwise, someone else will jump into it because it's going to happen one way or another. Joe, everyone's pretty much talked a, around the fact that to get into this space, we need to, you know, get a, a, a line voltage certification. We need to be certified electricians. We need to bring somebody on on staff. 
that has been something that you know we've we've butted heads with the electrical industry for a really really long time how do integrators scale up and you know whether it's whether it's becoming you know you yourself getting your electrical license or bringing somebody on how do you scale up appropriately to allow your company to not only have an an ec license but be able to keep that person busy because it's not worth it to bring an EC on and have him pull speaker cable. He's got to be doing line voltage. So as this industry is ramping up and you know, Sona is great, but I don't know. I, I know for myself, I can't have an electrician doing Sona every day of the week as much as Michelle would love that. <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> and, and revenue wise, we would too. I mean, yeah. <laughs> how, how do you, how do you do that? How do you scale up? You know, I don't know. I haven't figured it out. No, seriously. Um, <laughs> I'll answer that, but first I want to say congratulations to the guys over at Sonnen. I mean, they were the very first one that does what they do to embrace our industry. They were first. And, and to this day, you really only have two that embrace this at all. So congratulations to you guys, but then big kudos to Shell for recognizing one of two things. When you're a big uh, producer of fossil fuel and we're all to the race of zero, Somebody has to figure out how to not only push the envelope to the race to, you know, zero uh, footprint or negative footprint, but also how to monetize that on a corporate level or it will never become successful. So huge kudos to Shell for stepping that foot in and saying, we recognize this is important. We're going to be behind it and we're going to make it profitable for not just the big corporations, put all those guys down the chain to the bottom to the end user. So, you know, big kudos to them and congratulations to Sonnen. Thank you. I'll get back to Matt's question. Um, it's, it's a very tricky scenario, especially when other portions of our industry are changing as fast as they are. When we get into POE and low voltage lighting, uh, we kind of don't need an electrician as much as we used to, to provide lighting and, and, and those kind of things the value is coming down. And then for me to justify the value of to have that license, it can't be an apprentice or a journeyman. It has to be somebody at the master's level, which that uh, wage is, well, kind of dictated by a union. So there's things that are forced upon me to evaluate. Can I take a guy that it's mandatory that he's in the $60 to $85 an hour range can I justify that in my company to provide two pieces of my entire puzzle? As we're moving forward, I actually honestly think the answer is going to be yes. Um, and we are currently looking at that right now. The big problem is those people are hard to find because those are primaries within electrical companies or people within that level and they are not going to go because of the fear on their side, the opposite of our fear. They have the fear of the plug-in things that talk and technology. And you look at any makeup of an electrical business, it is put in a switch that goes on and off. I don't have service calls and I walk away. Ours is much more involved with the consumer in a lifelong relationship, which they're not used to. So we ourselves are trying to figure out how to bridge that gap because we see the need because of Sonnen and because of things going on in lighting. Then it has come to the point where for any company in our industry to be successful, bridging the gap with electrical and security is becoming a have to. We've already done the security portion. Now we're working on the electrical portion because we want to do more with companies like Sonnen. And we want to do more with companies like Ketra and others where, well, all of a sudden we need an electrical license. <laughs> um, but it is the future of our industries as a whole and those trade contractors that to provide that best, we have to bring those things together. And, and this big partnership, this big acquisition is, is proof right here. Very good. Well, and just one, one quick build on both um, what both Joe and Ian said. Uh, you know, we understand that this is we are merging together multiple industries here. And our, our solar guys know solar. Our electrical team knows electrical. You guys know home automation. And in many ways, everybody's asking the same questions. I don't know that I want to jump full into home automation because 
I don't understand the integrator business and that seems daunting. And the integrators are saying, well, I'm not sure that I want to jump into solar because I'm not sure that I want to put panels on the roof. So what we're really seeing is, is a, an opportunity to match make in, uh, in the current state where we're literally saying we've got good solar guys and good electrical guys and, and great you know, integrators. Let's match make these realize that the business model is there, the business cases are there, the, the industry is there. And then we're seeing some of these folks rise to the top and say, you know what, I'm ready to take this all on myself. I want to be an integrator who does solar plus electrical. So I'm going to take this to a whole different level. But it's, it's again, it's that comfort of getting there. To your points, you know, that is part of what we like to do is we're in the middle. So we're trying to match make because we, we talk to all of you all and, uh, and then we also try to merge you together because we have a full applications engineering support system at Sonin. And our sole job is to say, what are you putting into this house? And is it solar plus storage plus home automation? Great. We've got a team that will help you figure out how to do this the right way and, and walk you through the first three, four, five, ten, ten projects if you want. Uh, so it's really, we, we like to be in the middle helping facilitate that as well because we know it's a brand new, energy automation is a brand new industry, but we're innovators, we're not going to stop. So uh, our goal is to keep helping the innovations become bigger and better. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, thank you again for hopping on. Again, if people want to find out more information about Sonin, where can they do that? They can come to sonenusa.com. It's S-O-N-N-E-N USA.com. So thank you so much for having us. We are thrilled to move, move forward in this industry and help, help bring energy automation to the world in a, in a better way and help you guys innovate as far as being innovate and, you know, innovators yourselves. So we're excited to partner with you. And Michelle, Michelle, sign yeah. me up for that. You had me at Matchmaker. Done. Done. We will, we will get you into the dating pool. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, let's move on to our next story of the day. This comes to us from Residential Tech Today. Sonance has unveiled its first premium architectural speakers for the Sonos Amp. Uh, if you were unaware, Sonance and Sonos have had a deal uh, that they are working together and, and have been working together for uh, quite a while now where they co-developed a, a line of in-speaker, in-wall, and outdoor speakers that work directly and are designed for the Sonos Amp that was uh, released back in the late fall and just went general availability uh, about a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is a really a, a really fairly big deal. And Ian, I wanted to start with you. This is something that for the longest time, Sonos was a company that for the most part made a bunch of speakers. And they were really just speakers. Yes, they had AMP, uh, or well, Connect AMP and Connects that tied it into other things. But for the majority of people, they were using Play 1s, Play 3s, Play 5s. That was what they did. And the Connect AMP was kind of their olive branch to our industry and to people that were doing things separately. Now that they've got this, this line of actual speakers that they work together to develop, does this cement their connection to our industry and, and desire to realize that, yeah, we want to take advantage of all these cool things that AMP does and the fact that you now actually have speakers that let us do that really raises that bar. Is that, am I reading too much into this? No, not at all. I, I agree. Um, uh, Sonos has, has tried for a while to make sure that they're seen as more than just a um, black box kind of Best Buy um, do-it-yourself solution. They have a really awesome streaming uh, unit that is, once they open the API up, uh, can be integrated into large integration systems, which is awesome. But I think that they did realize, hey, we're missing out on a large channel. And uh, the fact that they're uh, expanding into more than just the wireless speaker is 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 definitely a big. They're they're showing commitment, and uh, it's pretty exciting. I think um, what the options that we are going to have now, um, where you can do an entire system with uh, with Sonos. Um, no, I, I couldn't agree more. It's 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 not huge, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on, and it's it's important. Very good, Joe. As soon as I saw this come up, I got excited. Is I, this why you asked me to come on last no, minute? Not exactly. Because no. of this story? No. no, but it worked out really, really well. 
<laughs> you might have started a hashtag called Sonos Doesn't Care. Um, you might have had a lot of conversations, and that was not, if you look at my notes, this is not at all the question I had for you, but I'm going to kind of twerk it as a side note into it based off what Ian said. Oh. <laughs> this is one of those things that I, I was at the initial um, you know, press announcement for AMP. I was there. I, I, I had a lot of in-depth conversations with the, the folks at Sonos about how they're really trying to change the perception within the industry. They're trying to grow that. You and I have had countless conversations about how companies like Sonos are, are working within our channel. The, the real question I had for you on this was more surrounding TruePlay and, and the ability to use that with the new Sonant speakers to allow you know, integrators to really tune multi-room audio, which is something that nobody else really does. But I wanted to kind of extend that and, and get into, A, that question of, does that give them a, a dramatic advantage over any other multi-room system that's out there right now? But more importantly, does that just continue to, kind of like what I asked Ian, does it just continue to show that they realize that there's a huge community of people that are trying to do fully integrated systems and having this as a true option is so much better than what the Connect Amp was with just any pair of speakers because this is supposed to, and I'm still waiting on <laughs> on my, my end ceilings to, to show up uh, to, to test this out, but this is supposed to make this system sound, in theory, better than anybody else's. So, you know, I, I do have to give a lot of credit to Andrew and Chris over at uh, Sonos. They have slowly and successfully started winning me back um, after all of that stuff. Um, the partnership, I think, is what's unique about it, because if you break it down into the technology as it sits, um, you, you've seen Sonance start to develop this way in the past. First thing we ever saw was the Sonaray and the way they use, you know, wattages and ohms to be able to use stereo pairs to support multi-speaker um, platforms. And taking this into something like a Sonos is like a match made in heaven. Because you know, if you look at the tech, they say a single amp can support up to six speakers. Now, that's kind of backwards because we all like independent zones. However, um, this gives much bigger coverage and dispersion. So that's kind of the magic word in this. Matt is the ability to, to disperse more quality audio. I think that's where their attitude of this does sound better than other things out there because they've changed the way you can disperse audio within a room. First with the amount of speakers, second with speakers that are perfectly built and paired for amps and watts, and the last thing is true play. And, and I've said this to a handful of manufacturers, please stop like sending me or packaging, prepackaging Odyssey microphones. Just stop. Because my iPhone has like five to seven noise canceling microphones in it. It has, you know, uh, um, depth and direction and all of these other kind of things. That's one of the things that Sonos di did so well with, with TruePlay. But now you can take it to an architectural facet where it's not, you know, we're EQing a whole room in an architectural fashion. That's like huge mm -hmm. um, because I don't care what anybody who does some high end calibration um, in a lot of these rooms, the tech inside this little phone is better than what most of us use at the end of the day. Um, but it's all about software analytics and all of that, which Sonance is, I mean, Sonos is kind of pioneered. So that's the portion that I think is big. Having some speakers that are branded to work with an amplifier is, it's been done and done and done and done. However, tying the tech part, the analytic part, the configuration part and all that together, that's actually a really big deal. And for it to come to, from Sonos to benefit our industry, it's a huge deal. Because not only are they listening to us on the product side, they're listening to us on the back end and the engineering side as well, giving us something no one gives us. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I'll just add in that I think it's a brilliant move by Sonos because they, as you say, they, by partnering with Sonance, which is a company that's dedicated to this channel 
they're, as you say, cementing their uh, relationship with the channel. They're also addressing the margin issue, which has been an issue with, at the dealer level. Um, so they're, they're committing to the channel, they're addressing the margin issue. And remember, they already have the number one um, multi room audio and number one um, uh, uh, wireless speaker and not even number one subwoofer being used by integrators, which I think when you look at it, unless they make, start making moves like this, the only way they could go is down because there was just more companies that were gonna be coming in and attacking that space because so many dealers carry Sonos, carry Sonos, not because they want to, but because they have to. Well, well, Jason, a move. Let, let me ask you this, just to expand on that for a second. They're, they've added essentially three more SKUs, which doesn't double their SKUs, but it's, it's 25% more. For them, that's significant. Yeah, it's 25% more SKUs than they've had in the past. You order them as a, as a dealer. You order them direct from them. You can't buy them through Sonance. If you're a Sonance dealer, you can't get these unless you're also a Sonos dealer. There's been hints of more products coming down the pipe. Is this a... It, is this all driven by their desire to expand their market and do all those normal things that we expect companies to do and expand their, uh, you know, desirable factor within our channel? Or is this all, I, I hate to drill it down to something this simplistic, but is this all stock driven? Is this all the fact that they are now a public company and they've got to continue to grow and expand to keep those shareholders happy. Absolutely, that's part of it, I'm sure. You're, you know, you have, they have to continue to grow to feed the stockholders. And um, you know, they've been very innovative. You know, let's not you know, slight that they have not, they've been a very innovative company all along. But you're right, they're gonna have to continue to grow and expand. They hinted in their latest quarterly call that there'd be even more innovation and more product expansion. They didn't say what categories or where. But um, I, I think that's part of it. Excellent. All right, gentlemen, let's uh, get on to our last story of the day, and then we'll wrap this up. This comes to us from strategy.com. Oops, Google might have forgotten to mention that they uh, built in a microphone into their Nest Secure. Just a, a slight little, whoops, we forgot. <laughs> Joe, I want to start with you on this. Um, how, Ser like, seriously, How who decides to put this in and then doesn't put it anywhere on a tech spec or on a patent filing or on anything else? Like, we're, we're, in, we're in a tech world where every little thing is scrutinized. How has this existed within a product and never been mentioned for what, six to eight months now? And all of a sudden it's found? How's that happen? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you know, that's one of those ones like uh, um, an Echo Dot has a video board on it. A lot of people don't know this. It would support HDMI. Do they talk about it? No. So I could kind of see, except for it's a microphone. You know, you go you like straight to the privacy jugular, like right there. Um you know, how do you not do that? Well, you didn't announce any features. We don't know if the thing's really been working or not. Um, I don't know how you miss that and what the long-term impl uh, implications are going to be for branding for them because it is something that has to do with privacy built into their security platform. Like, epic fail on so many different levels but it goes back to one of those things that we see happen with a lot of companies like them, Amazon, Sonos, blah, blah, blah. The, what happens on the engineering side, unless it is a big wow, doesn't trickle down to marketing and outreach. You know, it could have all these other bells and whistles, but if it's not the thing that marketing says, oh, I can sell it based on this, Nobody ever knows because we all know marketing rights to press releases, outgoing tech documents, white papers, all of these things for those types of consumer companies. So, so, it, so it is a big fail in communication if that's really what happened. Do I believe that's what happened? Honestly, I don't. 
Um, I think I think they engineered something with all the things that they can use later on and for you know firmware updates and other things that they want to do. But as a corporation, there was the fear of letting it be known that that's actually in there. Even if it wasn't used, the fact that it has a microphone under initial so shock with IoT security could have been detrimental to the release. So, yeah. so I, I think that was a little bit of maybe somebody will figure it out. Maybe somebody won't. We might get lucky. Unfortunately, the luck fell the other way. Very good. Jason, it, it, privacy is something that everyone is always dramatically concerned about. This seems to be a, a, a huge fail in, in Joe's words to not disclose the fact that there's a microphone, whether or not it was recording or not, that probably will never be truly determined. Does this hurt Naster Google in any way? Or is this something that will just exist until the next news cycle and the next Google issue or, or success comes up? I mean, honestly, remember when they had the missed up when the Nest Secure smoke detector first came out, there was some sort of a wave command and they, they had to end up turning it off and nobody even remembers that anymore. Um, I think it'll be forgotten, but I, this just, I go back to, you know, the CDA keynote or a couple of years ago who emphasized that integrators will be paid more. Yeah, I think he, he put a five year time frame on it. In five years, you'll be paid more by your clients to keep your clients off the internet than you're being paid now to get them on it. So it's just another kind of example uh, there. You know, I'm one of those benefit of the doubt guys, whether they just forgot to do it, as Joe said, a miscommunication with the marketing. Uh, I don't know. I, I, maybe that's true. Maybe there's more something more insidious there. I'm not sure. <laughs> Very good. Ian, I'll give you the last word on this uh, as we close out the show. Um, obviously, Google's whole uh, you know, corporate philosophy is don't be evil. This may or may not have violated that. But m more importantly, how do HTPs deal with this in the situation where they've sold it or they've got a client who's gone out and purchased it and asked for some help and install it or, or, or whatever? How do HTPs get in front of this type of situation? Is there anything they can do? Well, actually, I was really excited to talk about this. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I first I have to say, um, are we really that surprised by by this? And and secondly, do does the majority of people actually is it really their first concern at the end of the day? Um, most people aren't really even concerned or even remember that the fact that they're getting Amazon uh, ads that are ex from things that they've said earlier that day. Um, you know, microphones are always listening. So um, I don't think, I mean, it is, it is a big deal, but uh, I think I'm wondering what the, the repercussions are further down the road with uh, everything, sensors on everything. Yeah. Are we going to be now having to be more scrutinizing on every single device that we put in our home and checking every single sensor? And that is maybe where our HTPs are going to have to really um, inform their clients on. Now, it's going to be hard, obviously, if something like this, where if you were had sold this and, and set it up in your client's home and you no one knew that there was a microphone in it, we unfortunately cannot protect, HTPs can't, uh, be at fault because it wasn't even disclosed. Mm -hmm. um, but it goes into um, one thing that we can do of, of, of the knowing the security risks that are out there, knowing how to protect our clients through a, of a robust uh, network um, with a high security level. So we're making sure we're protecting our clients' data the best that we can. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to point out with this is, is down the road, uh, Rich Green did a talk at ISE, um, on the, on the CDS stage about the spatial web. There was just an email that came out today that is talking about it. And one of the things that he predicts shortly with all of the, all, all of our phones and all of our devices collecting data on us, eventually we will get to a point where we will be able to own our own data and then we can sell that data to the manufacturers and um, everyone that wants to, to acquire that. 
through and he goes through a really great um, thought process about how we can do that with blockchain and uh, making it secure and that we own all of the data that we have. But um, yeah, HTTPs are just, I think the biggest thing is security um, and helping your clients uh, protect their data and with their devices inside of their homes. You, you know, you know, Ian, I want to back that up by saying um, I did a CEDIA talk at KBiz and IBS specifically to home builders, designers, and architects about, you know, those IoT security implications and that kind of thing. And it, it, it was exactly what you said. You know, they, they know that is a concern and that's an issue. And it, we've come to the point where people are really starting to look at how, how can we help this situation? I mean, it is, it's real now. It's in their face. They are talking with a friend about whatever it is around their phone. And all of a sudden their Facebook feed is full of shampoo and conditioner. And they just are like, that's what they were talking about. Um, that is, you're absolutely right. The next couple of years, that security, you know, securing our clients is going to be big for us. And we are going to be the people they look to, to do that. Excellent. All right, gentlemen, let's leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Jason, if people want to connect with you, learn more about CE Pro, where can they do that? They can go to cepro.com or they can follow me on Twitter at Jason W. Knott. Excellent. Thanks again for being here. Ian, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Hopefully you had a, a wonderful first time experience with us. If not, don't tell me any different. If people want to connect with you, learn more about uh, Cedia, where can they do that? They can go to cedia.org. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at ibryant20 or email me at ibryant at cedia.org. Excellent. Thanks again for joining us. Joe, my good friend, if people want to connect with you, learn more about the Thoughtful Home, the Thoughtful Restaurant, the Thoughtful Bake Shop, the Thoughtful My Little Pony, where can they do that? So you can always find us on the good old Facebook at the Thoughtful Home, on Twitter at Thoughtful Home, and you can always find me involved in the amazing things that are being done at Stevia. Excellent. Thanks again, gentlemen, for joining us. For myself, if you'd like to connect with me, you can find me on Twitter at Matt D. Scott and many other social platforms. But more importantly, please stop by avianation.tv where you'll find this show as well as a wide variety of our other shows with all the verticals that we cover. When you visit the website, please take a moment to check out our supporters. We are extremely thankful for their support and ask that you support them as well. Thanks again for watching. That's all the time we have for this episode of Resi Week. Resi Week.